All right, so tonight we're looking for the Hatchet Man. We're on County Road 56 in Logan County, Ohio, real close to Bell Fountain. So supposedly, this guy named Andrew Hellman, he, uh, he killed his wife with a hatchet. And if you park your car out here and you turn it off and you sit here in the dark for a while, the Hatchet Man will come and find you. But of course, that's, that's just a legend, right? It's not true. There's nothing about that story that makes any sense at all, right? Welcome back to the Least Professional channel on YouTube, and welcome to Ohio Legends and Tales. How's everybody doing today? So if you're new here, my name's Josh. Uh, I, I do a lot of photography stuff on my channel, but uh, this is a series that I've started to take up where essentially what I'm doing is going over some of the legends and tales from around Ohio. The one in particular today is the legend of Andrew Hellman, AKA the Hatchet Man. All right, so to start this legend off, we need to go back to 1817, Baltimore, Maryland. A man named Andrew Hellman had just migrated here from Germany. The reason he came here was to be a tailor's apprentice. He worked as a tailor's apprentice for the next year or two, and when his apprenticeship ended, he decided that he wanted to go back to Europe and travel around and, and kind of see the world a little bit because he hadn't got a chance to do that. So in 1820, he came back to the United States and he took up residence with George Abel in Loudoun County, Virginia. Andrew became known during that time for having a, an extreme dislike of women. He would talk about how they should be servants to men, how their place was in the home, that sort of thing. But despite all of this, George's daughter Mary was infatuated with Andrew. And in 1821, Andrew and Mary were married. Now over time, Andrew would grow to dislike Mary more and more. But even with that dislike, in 1822, they would have their first child, Louisa. Now Andrew wasn't too happy about this, and he got even more upset in 1823 when their second child, Henry, was born. When Henry was born, Andrew would accuse Mary of cheating on him. He would say that she was a whore and that there's no way that the second child was his. So in 1824, Andrew and Mary and the two kids would finally move out of George's house and get their own place. In 1827, they would have their third child, John. So shortly after that, Mary's father, George, would decide that he wanted to give his children a good start and he would sell part of his farm that he had successfully grown over the years to buy land in Ohio for his kids. He gave Mary some land in Carroll, Ohio, just down south. In 1831, Andrew and Mary and the three children would all move to this farm in Carroll, Ohio. Over the next few years, Andrew would make this farm incredibly successful and he'd wind up buying a little bit more land on top of that. But during this time, he was also very unhappy with the fact that Mary, the land was actually Mary's because it had been given to her father. So he didn't actually own it, he just was married to the woman that did. In 1836, Andrew would sell both farms that he had, uh, that he'd grown successful over time. And with the money from, the, from selling the farms, he would actually buy a little bit of land in Logan County, Ohio by Bell Fountain. And Andrew and Mary and the three children would all move to this new farm in Logan County, Ohio. So the reason they picked Logan County to move to was because that's where Mary's brother George lived. That he'd been given the same type of land as Mary had by their father, and that's where his farm was. So it, it made sense to move out in that same area so they were closer to family. So over time, Andrew became more and more known for his bad reputation and, and his bad attitude all the time. But it was just seen as, as one of those things that just, it was Andrew. It was a, he had a bad attitude all the time. He wasn't a happy person. And it was just kind of seen and accepted and the family learned to kind of live with it. At, at one point, Andrew would actually try to poison Mary. Now, it was never proven in court or it was never proven anywhere but Mary found some white powdery substance in some milk that she was drinking 
And so she connected the dots and figured out that Andrew was trying to kill her off. But because she discovered it before she finished it, it wound up not having the effect that he intended and she survived through it. Now in 1839, all three children would become suddenly ill at the same time and nobody knew what was wrong with them. Within 48 hours, Louisa and John would both be dead. At the time, Louisa was 17 and John was 12. Henry was the only child that survived. Now, given the previous attempt on Mary's life, she was sure that he was the one that had poisoned the children and had wound up being the cause of two of their deaths. Later that year, on September 26, 1839, Mary's brother George would fall ill. This wasn't from a poisoning, this was a normal, not, no normal thing. He was just, he wasn't feeling well. So Mary would send Henry, their last remaining child, out to help George on his farm. So two days later on September 28, 1839, George's wife Rachel decided she wanted to go and visit her sister-in-law. So she left their farm and she headed on over. And when she arrived at the farm of Andrew and Mary, she would find that nobody would answer the door. But it was unlocked, so she went ahead and let herself in. Upon entering the farmhouse, she would find Andrew covered in blood, laying on, uh, laying on the floor. And he was just in misery and pain, and he told her that a couple of days earlier, some men had broken into the house and, and beaten him, and, and, and they didn't know what happened to Mary, and, and they, they'd been robbed. And he said, you know, check, check the back room for Mary. So Rachel would go in the back room, and that's where she would find Mary. So the state that she would find Mary in was, was miserable. She was she was cut up, she had gashes all over her, there's blood spattered all over the room, there's a pool of blood under her. It was very clear it had been a, a brutal death. So Mary left the farm and she went to go and, and get some help and round some people up to bring them in to, to figure this whole thing out. Um, and they actually assembled a coroner's inquest. Now back in the day, a coroner's inquest was, was essentially when somebody was murdered, they would bring in the coroner and a few other people, law enforcement officials usually, to go over and, and try to figure out what happened. All right, so so Rachel brings these people back to the farm and they, they start kind of going over everything and they're talking to Andrew and they're taking his statement and, and they're trying to piece everything together. Upon arriving at the house, Mary's other brother, John, John Abel, would actually accuse Andrew of, the, of, of killing Mary. And he asked the coroner, you know, he asked the investigators to check Andrew's body for cuts, bruises, scrapes of any kind. Because while he was covered in blood, it didn't look like it was his own blood. So that's what they did. They checked his body, and strangely, they didn't find any cuts on him, no scrapes, no bruises. He was completely unharmed. Um, he was just covered in blood, and, and it turned out it was Mary's blood. So uh, Andrew was arrested right there on the spot and taken to Bell Fountain to the county jail there to be held pending a trial. So the court that was going to schedule Andrew's trial was one of the Supreme Courts in Ohio. And the problem with that was that they were getting ready to go on recess and they didn't want to start the trial before they went on recess. So because of the timing and everything, Andrew actually wound up being held in the Bell Fountain, Bell Fountain County Jail over the winter of 1840. Because of the way things were in the jailhouse itself and, and with the weather and it being cold and that kind of stuff, what they would do is they would take Andrew upstairs into another room out of his cell during the daytime and then at night they would have him spend time in his cell. And, and this was kind of the, for his health and well-being to make sure he didn't freeze to death, that kind of thing. And, and usually they would come in in the evening, take him back, take him out of the room, take him downstairs, put him back in his cell, and then the next morning they would come up, take him back out of his cell, take him back up to this room. Well, one night in November of 1840, they were running really late to come and get him out of this room. And so Andrew decided he'd check out and see if he could just open the door. And it turned out he could. The door opened up, there was no guards outside, there was nobody around. So Andrew decided he was gonna walk out of there. So he walked out of the jailhouse and he went to, reportedly his lawyer, there's some questions about where, you know, he wound up getting a horse, but there's questions about where he got the horse from. Uh, most sources say that he got it from his, his lawyer. His lawyer actually sold him this horse. And he took this horse and he took off and he left into the dark of night. And they put together a search party to go after him, um, but unfortunately, they weren't able to find him. So 
now here we are at the Hellman family gravesite. This is where Louisa, John, and Mary were all laid to rest. Mary following the murder by Andrew, and the children following what, what appears to be the murder through poisoning. But this isn't where the story ends. So let's fast forward to a few years later. March of 1843, 370 miles away, in Resistor Town, Maryland. Catherine Hankel was desperately searching for her sister, Matilda Horn. Catherine had been told by Matilda's husband, Adam, that Matilda had just got up in the middle of the night and walked out of the house and left. She didn't take anything with her, she just left him. Now Catherine wasn't buying this, and so she was desperately trying to get anybody's help, and, and some and search parties were organized, and they were desperately trying to find Matilda because there was just no way she had walked out of the house in just her nightgown, and Catherine knew it. Now at first, nobody could find Matilda, but after a few days, that would all change. The searchers, including Catherine, would discover a coffee sack buried not far from the home of Adam and Matilda. What they would find inside that coffee sack would shake everyone to the core. It was the, it was the torso of a woman with her arms, legs, and head missing. Catherine knew right away that this just had to be Matilda. And she convinced enough people in the search party to go back to the house and, and research because they, she felt that something had been missed. Now, upon searching the house again, investigators would actually find another coffee sack in the, in, the, in the garage next to the house. And inside that coffee sack would be the arms and the legs of Matilda Horn. Now that wasn't all that they would find though, because in the stove, they found the partially burned head of Catherine's sister. Right away, police would turn their attention to Adam Horn as the primary suspect. But by the time they went to arrest him, he was nowhere to be found, and they didn't know where to look for him. Now, authorities would put out a description of Adam Horn. And that description would be spread far and wide, and it would make it right back to Logan County. And authorities in Logan County heard, read this description, and they saw it, and it was, it was Andrew Hellman right down to a T, all the way down to the fact that his third finger on his right hand was crooked. And they knew this just this had to be their guy, and, and he, he must have gone to Maryland after he had fled from Ohio. Well, it would take a few months, but in September of 1843, a private investigator in Philadelphia would wind up arresting Adam Horn. They, take, they took him back to Maryland to stand trial for the murder of Matilda, his wife. Now, once Adam was back in Maryland, Sheriff Slicer of Logan County, Ohio, would actually go out there because he wanted to confirm for himself is this Adam Horn guy actually our Andrew Hellman? And upon arriving to actually meet Adam, Adam recognized the sheriff right away. And he knew he knew who he was. And he greeted him as if he was an old friend. And, and for Sheriff Slicer, that was all the evidence that he needed, that this was Andrew Hellman. So the sheriff would go back to Ohio and he would wind up obtaining paperwork to extradite Andrew Hellman slash Adam Horn from Maryland to Ohio to stand trial for the murder of Mary Hellman. Now, though the governor of Ohio would give that order, the governor of Maryland, he didn't accept it. He basically said, hey, if this is your guy, that's great, but we want to try him first for what he did here. If somehow he slips through and doesn't get, you know, doesn't get hung, then we'll gladly ship him back to Ohio and you guys can charge him there. But authorities in Ohio would never get that chance. Adam Horn was tried and found guilty of the murder of Matilda Horn in November of 1843. He was sentenced to hang, with the execution to be carried out very shortly thereafter. Now, on the day of the hanging, Andrew Hellman's son, Henry, his, his last living son, would actually go to visit him, as well as, as, as forgive him for everything that he had done. So after that meeting, and a meeting with a priest, who also was able to, you know, who also said he forgave Adam of his sins and all that kind of stuff, um, Adam slash Andrew was taken up onto a scaffold. It was a special scaffold that had been built to be higher than the prison walls. And the reason why they had to do that was because, depending on reports, somewhere between 10 and 30,000 people showed up for this execution. This was a nationally known public trial. It was a big deal. It's also said that there were 500 tickets that were issued 
to spectators to come inside the walls and most of those tickets were actually sold for a profit. There was that many people, that not much interest in this, in this case. So Adam would be led up onto the scaffolding and they put the noose around his neck and they pull the handle and Adam Horn slash Andrew Hellman would hang until dead by the neck. Now, where Andrew is buried is not known because after the execution, they did what they would do for a lot of major cases and criminals during that time. And they buried him in a pauper's grave off site. Nobody knows what cemetery, but it was not in Ohio. They actually think that it was probably somewhere closer to Philadelphia or maybe up towards New York, something like that, just because they didn't want anybody to know where he was at. And the reason that they didn't want anybody to know where he was at was because a lot of people back in the day, when something like this would happen, when, when, it, when somebody was this evil, there tended to be people after the fact that would love to dig up the body and, and destroy the corpse because they didn't think that the person even deserved to be buried. So to protect, to protect the people after they were hanged, they would be buried in a situation where nobody could find the body. So what's that mean for the legend of the hatchet man? Uh, depending on where you're looking up the legend, there's people that will say that his headstone is here in the cemetery and it will glow at night. And there's people that say, you know, if you park on the road, that he will walk up next to your car and use his hatchet to kill you. All of that's, all of that's bunk. There, there's nothing to that at all. The, the legend was created based on some historical facts. There's always a kernel of truth in, in all of these legends that we're going to be looking at in this series. There's a kernel of truth somewhere in there. And people take it, and over time and years, it's told and retold, and things become warped in such a way that you, you can't really tell what's true and what's not true. Thankfully, for some of these things, there's historical precedent. There, there, there's paperwork, there's, there's court records, newspapers, newspaper accounts, that kind of stuff that we can go back and reference to be able to try and get at least most of the story, if not the full story. And in this case, yeah, it took some digging. There is some interest in this case that, that there's been books written and people that have talked about it, but none of that has gained enough publicity to dispel the urban legend. And so teenagers still come out here and there's houses nearby, but yet teenagers, teenagers will park on the street and they'll turn off their lights and they'll sit there and wait, waiting for Andrew Hellman, the hatchet man, to come walking up next to their window and, and kill them with a hatchet. All right, guys, so that's going to do it for this episode of Ohio Legends and Tales. What did you think of the legend of Andrew Hellman, a.k.a. the Hatchet Man? Uh, to me, this is one that when I first heard it years ago, I fully believed it because I still believed in ghosts at the time. And I thought it would be really cool to have an experience with something so creepy and scary. But looking into the history, the history is even worse <laughs> than the legend portrays it. Uh, because the legend leaves out the, the, the whole thing of him traveling over to Maryland afterwards and running away and changing his name, getting remarried. And something I forgot to mention when I was talking about when he killed Matilda Horn, she was actually pregnant. She was four, four or five months pregnant when he killed her. Uh, and they only discovered that on autopsy. So it was something to do with him not wanting to be tied to a woman or something. I don't know exactly what his reasons were, and I don't think we'll ever know because... He never said, and it was never written down. So something to think about when you, when you read some of these legends and stuff like that online, that it's not always black and white. It's not always as simple or as, as drawn out as it, as it seems to be. So with that being said, I do want to thank you all very much for watching. Let me know down in the comments if there's any legends that you, that you know of that you'd love to see covered in this series, because I, I do plan to continue this series on. I know it's, it's coming out in the fall of 2021, but I do plan on continuing it as an ongoing series on my channel. So let me know if there's any other legends that you want to cover or that you think would be interesting or neat or something that maybe you don't know the history of and, and I could dig into it and research it for you. If, you. if you do want to see more of these, make sure to hit the subscribe button. I know I didn't mention that earlier. <laughs> uh, make sure to like the video. And I'm going to try and do this right, but I want to put a playlist up right here. And that playlist is going to be for the Ohio Legends and Tales series. So make sure to check that playlist out. 
this fall as things go on you know it'll start with a couple of videos but there's going to be more and more that come along as i get out there more and get to do more stuff so keep an eye out for that and thank you all for watching and i will see you next video